Truth Caviar, the show about ideas that matter. Hosted by global thinkers, Brent M. Eastwood and Vadim Bichutsky. Welcome to the Truth Caviar Show, episode three. Today we're talking woke capitalism. So work capitalism, I first noticed woke capitalism probably in 2016. The state of North Carolina passed a transgender bathroom bill, if you recall, that basically said that you have to use the bathroom of your uh, of your born gender. That made all these all these corporations, the managerial elite so mad that they started boycotting the state. But remember, the state of North Carolina, the legislature was forced into it because the city of Charlotte passed a bill that said that you could use a bathroom of your choice. So if you were if you were born a man and then you transitioned to a woman, you could use the women's bathroom. And that the citizens of North Carolina, uh, that made them very upset because imagine if you're you have a man in the bathroom with a little girl. So the state stepped in and said, hey, this is unacceptable. All the floodgates opened. Obama made a statement. You had the NBA. So at uh, in 2016, the NBA All-Star Game was supposed to be in Charlotte. And uh, NBA said, hey, if you pass this bill, we're not go- we're going to boycott the game. We're not going to have the All-Star Game in your, uh, in your state. Nike came out. Apple came out. So that was the first, my first sort of inkling of like, something's wrong here. Woke capital existed before that. So, you know, Starbucks came out and, you know, in support of gay marriage. But I said, okay, that makes, you know, that made sense. It's however you feel about same sex marriage. Like, okay, I didn't have a problem with that. But, but something, something irked inside of me when this whole uproar started after the transgender bill in North Carolina. And I said, private entities have no business telling the citizens of a state what laws they can or cannot pass. So that was the first thing claim was like, you know, our democracy is, is under attack by these woke corporations. And then ever since then, you've you've had corporations boycotting Georgia over their abortion bill. And you had also Georgia over their voting rights bill. You had Delta come out, Coca-Cola started training, you know, all these corporations started all these critical uh, training their employees and how being white is oppressive and white people are the problem. So that was the first, that would, that really made me really question what's going on here. And that's what we want to talk about today. So we have a definition, a critical mindset now, and a new definition of a corporation. And this is shareholder capitalism versus stakeholder or multi-stakeholder capitalism. So traditionally, shareholder capitalism is about corporate profits delivering value to shareholders, that you invest in a corporation because it is increasing sales growth or it's increasing earnings growth. Or it's maximize profits profits for shareholders. Profit growth, revenue growth, value for shareholders, creating a product or service that is valuable to the consumer and to the shareholder. That's all that a corporation is supposed to do is maximize profit. That's the traditional definition of, of capitalism. Now they're trying to get into this social and cultural, enter into the cultural wars. And this is the new definition. We of talked about stakeholder capitalism last week mm-hmm. when we talked about the Great Reset. So stakeholder capitalism is an aspect of the Great Reset as well. And stakeholder capitalism focuses on climate change, racism, workers' rights, donations to nonprofits like Black Lives Matter. So the question is, is this a role that corporations should take? You know, BlackRock, which has $9 trillion under assets. Activist investors. Activist investors. We'll talk about ESG again. BlackRock has the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, which is an Orwellian kind of phrase. Uh, But he, uh, Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, wrote an open letter to all corporations saying that corporations should focus on improving labor practices, workforce diversity, uh, there's that one again, and climate change. Yeah, so there's sort of three legs of a co- of woke capitalism stool, if you will. You have woke executives who use their positions as corporate managers to advance a per- to advance a particular social agenda. So like Larry Fink of, of Larry Fink of BlackRock, you have JP Mor- uh, Jamie Dimon of JP Morgan, um, you have Tim Cook of Apple, Mark, Bana, uh, Mark Benioff of Salesforce, all of these left-leaning woke uh, CEOs. So that's woke executives. Then you also have woke investors, 
and uh, who demand that otherwise, um, to, who demand that CEOs use their companies to advance certain political agendas. So, so woke, in, woke investors like BlackRock, what they do is they buy shares in a corporation with the with the sole purpose of transforming this. Uh, this corporation into a vehicle of social activism. And then you have woke consumers. Um, you know, woke consumers start start boycotts. You know, I'm, I'm not going to like, uh, for example, Chick-fil-A, right? Uh, uh, the left has boycotted Chick-fil-A, I don't know, for the past 12 years or something. But Chick-fil-A is a, is a private company. It's not a public company. So they sort of, they have been able to manage that. But, but when you have investors, if you're a public company and you have a whole bunch of uh, shareholders uh, tell tell you how to you know they submit all these shareholder resolutions that say hey you have to come out in, fa- in favor of climate change or you have to come out in favor of gender diversity uh, and, and so on so that th- that presents a big problem for for publicly traded companies because they rely on their investors for capital um, and so you, so this is so there's like three uh, so this war on on business is being waged. On three fronts. Yes. And sometimes you get leadership in Congress that is pushing back on woke capitalism. And I'll give you an example of a senator that I used to work for, Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina. He was on the or is on the Senate Finance Committee. He had an opportunity where there are several banksters from Wall Street of the different investment banks and corporations in front of a panel. And he asked them, and they were they had already put out statements condemning the Georgia voting rights law. And Senator Scott said, did you read the law and do you know, can you put it in your words what this law is all about? Oh, yeah, I remember that. Crickets, total silence. And so he, Senator Scott pushed back a little bit more and said, well, what is your answer? Can you give any kind of answer? And they said, oh, it was from the Human Resources, Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity Group that we had no idea that they were going to say that. And so Senator Scott was like, well, you're the CEOs. How would you not know what that situation is? Because it's your corporation. So at least we're getting some people who are pushing back on this. So you got you got CEOs. So there are two types of, of CEOs. There are woke CEOs who essentially believe in this agenda and who drive it within their within their companies. But you also have CEOs who don't believe it, but who are cowards, who are afraid to come out, who are afraid to 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 come out against their 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 woke employees um, and defend and, and defend traditional capitalism. So let's go back a little bit and sort of um, uh, uh, lay the groundwork of how we got here. So the rise of the managerial elite in the 20th century happened on two main fronts. It happened in within government with the rise of the administrative state. So people like Woodrow Wilson, uh, proto-progressives, who believed that the best way to manage the affairs of the state was to create this class of people who would be insulated from the day-to-day politics and, and would just be in charge of, of managing the affairs of government. So hence the rise of the administrative state. Um, now, you can argue it's, it's, it, that it's good and bad. Um, the problem with the administrative state is that they're they're insulated from the will of the people. They're not involved in politics. The people have no say who is in charge of these agencies. So for example, the people could elect somebody like Trump, who's a populist, but it's up to the administrative state to implement all the executive orders that he signs. And they could just, they, they may or may not implement them depending on what they feel is, is the right thing to do and what other agenda that they have. So, so we have the rise of the deep state. And there's the rise of the managerial class and administrative class. Uh, that is coming from academia and university administrators. They're, they're yeah. corporate bureaucrats now, and they're not adding value to the shareholders, and they're not creating products or services. So that is a frustration for those who are following the emergence of this woke capitalism and woke economics. Yeah. So you got the rise of the managerial elite within businesses as well. So you have the CEOs, Mark Benioff at Salesforce, J- Jamie Dimon at JP Morgan. Why is that a problem? What is the purpose of the corporation? As Brent said, the traditional view of capitalism is that the corporation is a legal invention. So you get two things as a corporation. You get limited liability protection. If let's say you're in McDonald's and you fall down and you break 
break your leg, right? You can sue the corporation McDonald's, but you can't sue the shareholders of, of McDonald's. Uh, so you get limited liability. And the other thing that classical capitalism says is that the sole purpose of a corporation is to maximize profits for its shareholders. Now, why is that second thing important? By constraining the corporation to just focusing on profit, by design to limit the scope of what the corporations can do. Economic entity, it's not a political entity. Your, your job as a corporation is to make money for the shareholders, make goods and services that people love, enabling you to become rich. You have no business interfering in, in the American political system. That's the purpose of a corporation. But now you have these CEOs, these woke CEOs, and they say, hey, well, I know my job is to make money for shareholders, but I have my own brand. So these, these CEOs have their own agendas. That's a part from the agenda of the shareholder, which is to make money. These CEOs embrace stakeholder capitalism as a way to push the agendas that they support onto the American people. And it's also coming from politicians too, like Al Gore, who is saying, hey, corporations can be, and executives can be sued. He thinks the individual CEOs can be sued for not focusing on ESG, not focusing on stakeholder capitalism. So you're getting these elites that are coming in from the Ivy League and from different types of business schools now. And if you go back to undergrad, the last graduating class from Harvard this spring, only one to two percent of the entire graduating class was considered conservative. The rest considered themselves progressives or liberals. So this is where the schools are coming in. And then the business schools, Harvard, Stanford, University of Chicago, Northwestern, the top business schools are also fostering this stakeholder capitalism stakeholder model. Capitalism right. This, model. this idea that corporations shouldn't just pursue profits, but they should per do good for society as well. So just to back up a little bit, we talked about the managerial class, right? The rise of managerial class. So, and Brent just mentioned education, right? So the other, the other track from which we've seen the rise of the major elite is the university system. And that goes back to the Frankfurt, Frankfurt School and critical theorists that believe that American society is oppressive, capitalism is oppressive, and to be critical, you have to be activists first and foremost. You shouldn't just be a capitalist. You shouldn't just go into the private sector, create great business, create great products and services, and live the American dream. Your duty as a citizen is also to be an activist and hence the rise of the activist investors. And I think what's alarming is they're getting not only involved in federal administrative rulings and laws that are coming from Congress and the president, they're getting down into state and local government. And this is increasingly frustrating for people who are trying to say, hey, I am investing in this company because I'm looking for share growth. I want to make a profit, too. I want to have dividends paid to me. Now, we have been focusing and talking about corporations that are publicly traded, but private companies, startups and technology, they have boards too, and they also have shareholders. So this is permeating down to small companies too, especially coming out of Silicon Valley. So you have venture capitalists who are woke and looking at diversity, inclusion, and equity. You have other types of investors, angel investors, you have companies that are going from Series A to Series B to Series C, adding shareholders along the way and boards. And so the boards are coming in and saying, you must be diverse. You must include people. You must be uh, environmental on the DIE situation, the ESG. So what we're trying to get forward, uh, the forward point that we're trying to talk to you about is the way that stakeholder capitalism has taken over shareholder capitalism. Exactly. And uh, just to back up a little bit. So Brent mentioned Al Gore and he's saying how, well, if you know, if you don't invest in ESG, you're going to be sued, which is actually wrong. Al Gore has it in reverse. His strategy, the ESG investment strategy, breaks the fiduciary duty that investors have to their shareholders. Like everything that progressives say, it's actually the inversion of what they say. Yeah. And going back to startups who want to do an IPO and become publicly traded, the investment banks on Wall Street are saying, hey, you better act right. You better do ESG. 
and diversity, equity, and inclusion are we're not going to lead your IPO. We're not going to help you become public. In 2020, Goldman Sachs put out this statement at the World Economic Forum in Davos that said, we will not take a company public unless a diverse board. They didn't really define it, what that meant. But, but that was actually a trick. Why? Because all of the companies that go public have very diverse boards. And so that was basically a PR stint. That was a trick. That was a PR stint that basically cost them nothing, but made them look good. Like they cared about these progressive woke values. That's how the game is played. Woke capitalists embrace these progressive woke values. That's really cheap for them. So hiring Ibram Kendi or Robin D'Angelo to speak to your corporation might cost them 20 grand or something. But it's much cheaper than fighting Occupy Wall Street. So they essentially buy the silence of the left with their wokeness. How about the example of the Black Rifle Coffee Company going public, where you Ooh, had a, a company who is trying to set itself up as the conservative version of Starbucks. They started changing some of their policies. Right, too. right. You, you yeah, I remember, yeah, I remember they came out in, I guess it was in last summer, right before they went public and they, in the New York Times, and they started downplaying their conservatism and their anti-wokeness. So yeah, this game is played everywhere. You hear us talk about stakeholder capitalism and woke capitalism. I just want to emphasize while those two models are related, they're not exactly the same. Stakeholder capitalism is more of an academic theory. The way I would distinguish woke capitalism and stakeholder capitalism. Stakeholder capitalism, an academic theory, and woke capitalism is practical. Let me explain what that means. In late 60s and the 70s, you had a bunch of business school professors come out in favor of stakeholder capitalism theory. In 73, also, Klaus Schwab published the Davos Manifesto that basically said, hey, capitalism has to change. We have to embrace the stakeholder model. In, in practice, what happened was wokeness infiltrated Wall Street and other corporations after the 2008 financial crisis. And so what, what the big banks, remember, after the 2008 financial crisis, the banks and, and capitalism was under attack. Occupy Wall Street movement was coming after them, saying, you're greedy bastards, you're, you're bad for, for America, all you care about is money, you caused this great recession. Let's leave aside for a moment whether the big banks actually cost uh, the Great Recession. It was actually government, bad government policies, although the banks did have a role to play in the Great Recession. But let's put that aside for the moment. After the 2008 financial crisis, the big banks and Wall Street was under attack by the Occupy Wall Street movement. And in Vivek Ramaswamy's book, Woke Inc., he gives this magnificent example of how Wall Street realized that, hey, if we just embrace wokeness, that will buy off the silence of this new left, of the new woke left. So he, he gives an example how, I think it was, I believe it was in 2011, there was this, this protest um, in New York, the Occupy Movement protest. And this lady comes up to the mic and says, okay, uh, she had a list of people to speak. And then she said, minorities and marginalized groups will speak first. And, you know, that draws some boos in the crowd. And there was this, this white male who said, well, actually, actually, that's not right. Why are we prioritizing those groups? We, we have all suffered under by these big banks, you know, so everyone deserves a voice. We shouldn't prioritize one group over the other. That made Wall Street realize, hey, if we just embrace these woke progressive values, gender diversity, speak out against racism, anti-racism, climate change, that will satisfy the woke millennials, the woke left. It will provide us cover to continue doing what we've been doing, but it will make us look good in front of these woke millennials and this ascendant woke left. It satisfies the media too, because business media like CNBC and Bloomberg are also woke and liberal. It's so if you virtue signal... You can put the elites at bay, the Wall Street Journals, the New York Times, CNBC, Bloomberg, and they will stay away from you. So then you can go back to doing what you always did, which is making tons of money. Essentially, Wall Street figured out how to play this game where they virtue signal to the progressive left while not changing any of their business practices and continuing doing business as usual. When we say woke capitalism, that's really what we mean is that the corporations embrace these woke progressive values as a smokescreen to continue doing business than usual, and avoid accountability for their horrendous business practices. They're so hypocritical, too. So you have Amazon, who are firing African-Americans for protesting adverse work conditions, yet they virtue signal in public by donating to African-American causes, which th that's fine. They can do that. But they're also, they're hurting the minorities, too. Nike, 
donating to African American organizations. That's fine. But what about the working conditions in Vietnam? The people who are making your shoes? Uber donates uh, to the same types of organizations, but they take advantage of their 1099 workers. That's how the game is played. In the open, you embrace these woke values. Behind closed doors, you continue doing business than usual, often even worse. I, I just want to kind of nail this point home. Woke capitalism, another way to think about this is that it's crony capitalism 2.0. Crony capitalism was basically the way it worked traditionally is you had these big banks, Wall Street, that what they would do is they would donate to politicians and then their executives would work for the government. So like Henry Paulson worked in the, in the, in the Bush administration. Uh, and had been at Goldman Sachs. And right? Goldman Sachs, right. And then Stephen Mnuchin also was at Goldman Sachs and then he worked for Trump. That was crony capitalism. The old way of doing crony capitalism was donating to politicians and lending your expertise to the government. And why did that work? Well, if you remember when the bailout came, Henry Paulson bailed out its alma mater, Goldman Sachs, but he let Lehman Brothers and some of its competitors fail. So that's how crony capitalism 1.0 worked. Now, crony capitalism 2.0 is this woke capitalism, where not only does it keeps the woke left at bay, but it also is good for the progressive politicians like President Obama and Elizabeth Warren and, and uh, Bernie Sanders. So uh, it buys them favor with, with the progressive left in government, and it also immunizes them from scrutiny and government regulation. And this goes to party too. The parties have kind of flipped because traditionally you had Republicans who saved corporations with lower taxes and regulation relief. It, it used to be that lobbyists would come into Washington and focus on the Republican Party and, and try to get relief based on different administrative rulings that they had, based on regulations that they didn't like and taxation they didn't like. The 2017 tax it, uh, cuts were aiding corporations from Republicans. Now there are Republican members of Congress who say, hey, don't come to us anymore. We have saved your bacon before, and then you turn around and we're the enemy. You make one party the enemy. So you always have to have this victimhood and an enemy, a class enemy. So now it's flipped. Now the elites on Wall Street and in corporate America who have come from these elite institutions, schools and business schools are now identifying with the Democrat Party and Republicans are the enemy when the Republicans have been the party traditionally that, has helped, that have helped corporations. Corporations have sort of taken Republicans for granted that they will always be there. They will always fo vote for less regulation, lower taxes. You know, our job, the way the world corporation viewed it is like, we have to appease this woke left. They're coming after us. If we're not in good graces with them. They'll hammer us with regulation. I'm glad to see that a lot of conservatives, a lot of Republicans are finally starting to hold big, you know, big tech and woke corporations accountable, what I call crimes that they've been perpetuating on the American democracy. There's a lot of pressure on tech CEOs to be woke and to get in compliance with what the boards say and what Wall Street says. And I know this as a founder and CEO of a tech company where my tech company, we had an African-American employee and we had a board member, an advisory board member who's African-American. But I wanted to get a little more diverse because I felt that pressure. So I did a job search for three different types of employment and I made three offers to three different women. One woman totally ghosted the offer and never got back to me. Another woman insulted the company, insulted the project that I was going to be on and insulted me. <laughs> and another woman said, no, I'm not going to take the job. So if there was an ESG type of situation that forced me to tell, for example, the SEC about my board and about my company and not being diverse, what would I say? You know, I have to sit there and say- You well, would have been a bad guy. I, I would have been the bad guy, even though I tried to make job offers to women. Right. Well, again, you know, it's, it's really frustrating. And I see it in the media. I see it with CNBC and Bloomberg and New York Times, Wall Street Journal, where- corporations feel that pressure that they have to deliver to stakeholders and not shareholders. Coming back to this uh, ESG being hammered, you know, by the SEC and stuff. Well, he who has the gold makes the rules and who has the gold, you know, the finance industry, the Wall Street. So, you know, that's just the way the game is played, right? That's why you want to be in finance because you control basically the entire economy. If you're, you know, that's why something like 16% of, of our GDP is being driven by finance. You know, the best and the brightest, they go on Wall Street, right? They want to go into finance because that's how you become rich and that's how you control the economy. And there's there's this training. I had to go through implicit bias training f through one place that I worked. I won't name it. It's not important, but I went through the implicit bias training. I didn't understand what was going on. Uh, it lasted three hours 
And there was a lot of talk about systemic racism, but nobody defines these buzzwords. So there's these Orwellian language and concepts that come out of this training and it's just going over your head and you're wondering, okay, what am I supposed to do? And I took it seriously. I tried to understand. Did they tell you that white man is the problem? There was some critical race theory in there too. There's some critical theory. One person who I worked with, they gave us all these handouts and all these folders and he came out and threw it away in a garbage can. And I didn't throw mine away, but that was just an example of was what that you're having fired. To, no, that person wasn't fired, but it kind of surprised me. He was like, he might be on the layoff list. <laughs> <laughs> hey, maybe next. Yeah. Yeah. This nexus of big business and big government is the fundamental threat to liberty these days. It, it's not just big government. All those slogans you hear the conservatives repeat from the 1980, big government is the problem. Yeah, we agree. Big government is the problem. But this new Leviathan, the merging of big business and big government and woke corporations, and you got the big tech controlling what, what we hear, what we can uh, talk about, how we make money, you know, what we can and cannot say, what's misinformation, what's disinformation. All of these Orwellian tactics that are being deployed on the populace these days. That's the challenge of our time is to fight this nexus of big government and big business. And they're making money just like they used to. BlackRock, one of the biggest asset managers in the world, has ESG investing. You can choose to invest in companies and mutual funds that focus on ESG. Well, when that happens, there's more money in your assets. And then BlackRock can charge more, a higher percentage in fees and then make more money and more profits. So you see, it's it's this insidious thing. AstraZeneca, you know, vaccines, all right? They got a, a $1.2 billion grant to develop vaccines from the federal government. But then they go to Davos at World Economic Forum and they say, hey, we're going to do a $1 billion donation to fight climate change. Oh, AstraZeneca, they're great. They're saving the world. So you see how this gets into the CEOs of these companies and they believe this stuff. And then they take their private jets and they go to Davos, they go to the World Economic Forum and they start in with their world conquest from these woke capitalists and elites. A bunch of woke millennials got together with big banks and together they said, hey, Occupy Wall Street, you can go home now. We don't need you anymore. Big business is going to espouse these woke values, the supercharged wokeness with the weight of capitalism behind it. Th that made the new left happy. That made the Obama administration happy because remember, Obama's woke. That also drove up the left's money making machine. You know, the woke nonprofits got rich from it. So I don't know if you remember, but there's uh, there's the story that Vivek Ramaswamy tells in his book in 2014 or 2013. The, the justice Department uh, reached a settlement with the big banks, you know, something like 13, you know, 13 billion dollars that Bank of America had to pay and Chase and JP Morgan, all of these banks, right? City, Goldman Sachs. C Goldman Sachs and all that. They reached these settlements with these banks. During that same time, the Obama administration tried to fund left wing nonprofits in Congress, but the Republicans in Congress, who were a majority back then, said, no, like it or not, that's the way our system works, right? Congress has the power of the purse. So having failed at that, the Obama administration did something creative. They went back to the big banks and said, hey, let's say you're Bank of America and you owe us 13 million or whatever it was. Billion. But it was billion. It was billion, right? $13 billion, right? He said, hey, for every dollar that you donate to left-wing nonprofits, and we'll give you a list of nonprofits. So it was like La Raza and, and the NS Urban League. For every dollar that you donate to those left-wing nonprofits, we offset that by $2 from your settlement, from the amount you have to pay for your settlement. And Wall Street jumped at that opportunity. Why? Obviously, it saves them money, but, but guess what? It makes for a better press release to say that you donated to charity than to say that you were fine. And the insidious <laughs> thing was that the fines were supposed to go to help people with their mortgages yeah. that got ripped off during the financial crisis and the mortgage bubble that popped. And so, so, so that's how this woke industrial complex works. The managerial class gets rich, especially the left-wing managerial class gets rich while the American people in our democracy loses. And you know, this is so frustrating, especially I'll go back to when I was a CEO of a tech company. You have just a lot of pressure on you to try to deliver value to your shareholders and your board, but also be aware of the trends in diversity and ESG, environmental, social, and governance. So it's very hard to do. And, and if we get to the point, 
and the Biden administration wants to do this with the SEC, where every year, you're, or maybe it's every quarter, you have to do an ESG report back to the SEC and talk about your inclusion and diversity and your hiring practices. Who gets rich on that? Well, it's going to be lawyers who are negotiating with the SEC and trying to figure out what to divulge to the SEC, and also consultants who come in who are ESG consultants. So this is going to cost the corporations billions of dollars, according to the Heritage Foundation. And the Heritage Foundation did a study, and they looked at this, and they said, this is this is a cost that is coming from the Securities and Exchange Committee is supposed to protect shareholders from these practices. And now look at that. Look how it's flipped. It's flipped back over to ESG. Here's another example of this woke industrial complex. In 2015, uh, President Obama promised to put a million electric vehicles on the road and asked Congress for $300 million to make it happen. Republican-controlled Congress said no. But the Obama administration then went to Volkswagen. Volkswagen was in their crosshairs because they had defrauded the government by bypassing their climate emission tests. And so the DOJ forced Volkswagen into a settlement where it had to invest $1.2 billion in creating electric vehicle charging stations. So you see how the woke industrial complex uses the levers of government and the woke corporations to enrich itself and their cronies. That's why we said it's crony capitalism 2.0. And here it is again. You know, we see this stuff over and over. And then there's the companies that are cracking down on conservatives. So you have Airbnb, is obviously woke. They're not renting to certain conservatives they don't like. Uh, you have other corporations. You have Google, who on Gmail is changing its algorithm to to rate certain emails as undesirable from conservatives. They go to your spam folder. If we were on video, I would show you my spam folder and my Gmail account is filled with conservative causes, conservative politicians who are trying to raise money, and it's going to spam. And so if you multiply that for thousands of people, it's going to affect fundraising for conservative groups. Uh, speaking of Airbnb, you heard what happened to Michelle Malkin, where she was denied service because some some liberal pointed out that she's a conservative. And But here's the trick, right? The same Airbnb who espouses stakeholder capitalism, who puts a black square on their Instagram, support of BLM, the same corporation had given access to American users' data to the Chinese Communist Party in exchange for entering the Chinese market. Stakeholder capitalism and woke capitalism, it's a cover for corporation to be seen as this do-gooders, when in effect, they're ripping their users and their consumers and the American democracy at large in their pursuit, in their sole pursuit of profit. Yeah, they have your phone number, they have your email, they have your credit card numbers, you know, different sh data sharing that the Chinese Communist Party require companies to do to do business over there. You look at the NBA, right? Doing business in China. Daryl Morey, when he tweeted that stand with Hong Kong, th they didn't even defend him. Adam Silver, the commissioner of the NBA, he basically groveled to the Chinese. He said, he shouldn't have done that. We're sorry. We love China. LeBron James and Stephen Curry, Steve Kerr and Greg Popovich, all of these woke players in the NBA. MBA and coaches, they're not defending America at all. They're, they're not standing up for American values. The Chinese have essentially, in certain cases at least, they have shut down America's freedoms here on American soil. MBA sided with the Communist Party instead of the general manager, Daryl Morey, who said, we should support the democratic efforts by the Hong Kong protesters. He should be able to say that and not cause any trouble. Same thing with that. Make their iPhones there. Foxconn, Apple's contractor in China, something like 15 people committed suicide, workers, because they couldn't handle the working conditions there, like in the, in the last year or something like that. And they use child labor. You know, they lecture us, American citizens, about what we can and cannot do, can or cannot say, and how people of North Carolina and Georgia and Texas uh, and Utah and, um, and others are supposed to behave when they're sucking up to China. It's communist government. I mean, it's this is outrageous. And what happens is the, the Chinese, they have concentration camps of Uyghurs. Uh, genocide. In, genocide, right. And they're silent on that while they're criticizing America. Here's the rub, right? The Chinese Communist Party has figured out that we could 
use these woke corporations as Trojan horses to advance their interests on the global stage. The Chinese Communist Party is using woke corporations as a geopolitical tool. Why? Because when the Chinese are pressured for their human rights abuses, for their genocide of Uyghurs, they say uh, Black Lives Matter shows that America is no different. These woke corporations undermine the moral standing of America on the global stage. That's a classic communist kind of rejoinder where you say, well, you're accusing us of human rights violations. Well, what about what you're doing with African Americans? Making yeah. moral equivalencies. Right. We live in a very dangerous time. We need business leaders who are patriotic, who love America, who say, hey, yeah, I might lose a few billion dollars by not entering the Chinese market. But guess what? American values are more important than making an extra buck. We need to train a new generation of business leaders that believe in America, that believe in the nation state, that believe in our values, that believe that America is is, is a shining city on the hill. You know, and it's some of these companies that have become so woke and elitist, you look at McKinsey, which is probably arguably the top management consulting company in the world, and they're completely woke. Well, they have dirty little secrets too. You've heard of Purdue Pharma, which produced OxyContin. Do you know that McKinsey was the number one management consultant for Purdue trying to get them to learn how to get more people hooked on Oxy to make more profits. So these companies virtue signal, but then they have dirty little secrets. You know, they don't like to talk about how their business is making a lot of money in China. They don't like to talk about Purdue Pharma and OxyContin, but they do it to make money and make profits, even though they're elitist organizations that espouse different types of rhetoric and virtue signaling. And you look at Disney sucking up to China, you know, filming Mulan there and thanking the propaganda services of China for their cooperation. You know, Hollywood always changing, changing scripts to appease the Communist Party, embracing communism essentially instead of American values. So this is a very frightening development uh, in our democracy where all of these private entities who are not bound by the Constitution are using their market power to subvert American democracy and essentially subjugate the American people to the whims of, of communist regimes. I would like to require some of these CEOs to study and really get involved with knowing the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. I think that would be, you know, how many CEOs have experience with political science and government? They don't. So they are just learning this stuff from the media. They pick it up from different types of CEOs. They pick it up at the World Economic Forum and other types of forums that they go to during their time where they take private jets to these big things, big big elitist organizations that have conferences and they get together and they say, oh, we need to do this. We need to do that. Well, if they're so interested in politics, why don't they read the Constitution and understand what's in the Constitution? That's what I would say. And Silicon Valley, you know, they really want to increase their social, cultural and political power. I mean, that is clear especially during COVID-19, where he had YouTube banning people talking about alternative therapies to COVID-19, people who talked about that they didn't like the mask mandates or the shutdown mandates. All of that was purged by YouTube. We talked about Google and spam and email. MailChimp refusing services of its email services to Republicans. Facebook banning posts critical of lockdowns and masks. Twitter, of course, with the Hunter Biden story in, in the New York Post, blocking New York Post, Twitter blocking the stories. So you see how Silicon Valley wants to jump in there, too. They want to say they have diversity of thought. No, they don't have diversity of thought. They want to say they have diversity of ideas. No, they don't. They want to say they have diversity of intellect. Well, they should have all those. There should be diversity of thought, diversity of ideas, diversity of intellect. That's what Woke Incorporated, the book, talked about. But no, it becomes race, it becomes gender, and that's the big point that they like to talk about more. You mentioned some of the CEOs who have no understanding of politics and political science, which is why I'm so heartened by seeing Elon Musk get into the public sphere a little bit more than he has in the past and defend American values, freedom of speech, buying Twitter, standing up for what's right, even though he does do business in China. It's refreshing to see somebody who, a CEO who stands up and, and says, no, I mean, this is America. Americans shouldn't have to make a choice between putting food on the table or speaking out publicly. That's fundamentally un-American. In America, America, we have the freedom of speech to say what we think, 
without sacrificing our jobs or our investors or how much money we can make. That's the American dream as we know it. I'm so happy to see people like Elon Musk, people like Vivek Ramaswamy speaking out and fighting this woke industrial complex, defending America. L look, without America, we don't have capitalism. We don't have the goods and services. We don't have Twitter, right? There's a reason why Twitter was invented in America, because our culture, because our capitalistic culture, entrepreneurship was designed to empower people to use their ingenuity and their creativity to create goods and services that not only make them rich, but also make society better as a whole and make life better for ordinary citizens. And I would like to take a look at corporations and CEOs who are apolitical. Back, you know, turn back the clock to when corporations were not involved in politics whatsoever. You look at Coinbase, uh, the CEO, I think his name is Brian Armstrong. He has an apolitical workplace. Netflix is starting to get some of this stuff. And they're saying, hey, if you don't like it, uh, there's the door. If employees, you know, we talk about Elon Musk a lot on this show. He had a group of people, I think, both at Tesla and at SpaceX that got together and wrote this letter and said, oh, we don't like the way you're acting. We don't like your politics. And Elon fired him. Exactly. So you're seeing we're seeing some, some pushback. We're seeing some pushback. That's awesome. But we need more. We need a renaissance of Americanism. Give the power back to the people. You are in control of your own destiny. You want to go to college. You don't want to go to college. You want to start a company. You want to be a writer. You want to be whatever you want to be. You have complete control and autonomy over what you want to do with your life. And you should be able to profit off of your work without sacrificing your beliefs and your constitutional rights as Americans. I was a little depressed when I read Woke Incorporated because I got to the end of it and I said to myself, are the corporations winning? Is wokeism winning? Are they really going to change America the way they want to change? And then Vadim, you were saying, well, we, we have some heroes that we can point to like Elon Musk's and others that are pushing back. I don't know. Do you think the corporations are winning this battle of the culture wars? I think they're definitely ascending. And I think right now I would have to say, yes, they're winning. I think there's pushback now. And I think conservatives and traditional Americans who, who love the constitution, they're starting to push back. They're starting to say, hey, I'm not going to shop at your store. One of the reasons why we have seen the rise of this woke industrial complex is, you know, conservatives don't boycott corporations. No, they sort of say, okay, well, I may not like this. I mean, you know, I got a family, I got a job. I'm not going to worry about it. I had a business to run. On. That's sort of the conservative mindset. But I think a lot of conservatives realizing that if we don't stand up, if we don't fight back, you may not want it to come for you, but eventually it will if you don't stand up against it. I think the pushback is starting. I'm hopeful, actually. I see people like Vivek Ramaswamy and Elon and a few other business leaders, people like Peter Thiel, who are starting to, to put money where their mouths are, starting to fund new ventures, new, new new universities, new media companies that are pushing back on the stuff. The dam has been broken and, and people are starting to realize we got to stand up now or else we're going to be living in a totalitarian state. What we need are more rebels at Ivy League schools and elite institutions. Ron DeSantis, a product yeah, of Harvard yeah. and Yale. Yep. Uh, J.D. Vance, a product of Yale Law School. Yeah, he went to Yale. Yeah. And so people are going to this, these institutions and pushing back and saying, hey. And also in the media, people like Tucker Carlson who are pushing back against this stuff. Yeah. They, so we need more rebels. We need more people to stand up. And it, it's really scary, though, when uh, an un, undergraduate class at Harvard University, only 2% are conservatives. But maybe those two people out of 100 can be the next CEOs that write books about woke capitalism and woke economics. I'm a little bit skeptical about these polls because a lot of people who are conservatives don't want to say that they're conservative. I actually think that we are the majority. You know, the term silent majority, the majority of Americans are against corporate wokeness, against the woke industrial complex, but they're silent. See, the problem is that they're silent. They're afraid and understandably, right? If you have four kids and a mortgage and you work at Apple, you may be a traditional American, but you feel like you don't have the freedom to speak out against the stuff. That's actually why we started this podcast. We want to speak out. We want to encourage you to speak out. We want to provide you with facts so you can make your own decision about what to do. And talking about laws that are coming from Washington, D.C., based on race and gender. Juneteenth is a good example. Now, that's a, that's a good law. That's a good holiday. And we support that. But what was interesting, I was uh, I got the day off on Juneteenth. I didn't expect it. My, my job said, you're off. My wife was off. Uh, we we're doing home improvement to our house, and we're looking for somebody to hang up some blinds, uh, work around the house. And we didn't know when this person was going to start. So we're off on Monday on Juneteenth. And the person came in to install the blinds, and this person happened to be African-American. And I said to myself, wait a minute. 
this is Juneteenth. We're supposed to be commemorating something very important in American history, yet the African-American has to work. And my wife happens to be Hispanic, but I'm white. And so we were off and the African-American guy had to work. And you're saying to yourself, wait a minute, we're so caught up in race and gender and some of these laws and to virtual signal, and it doesn't even help the people that it's supposed to help. Wokeness is meant to make liberal white people feel better. I mean, that's essentially what it is, right? I mean, it doesn't benefit African-Americans. It doesn't benefit Hispanics. It benefits woke white people. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about, Vadim, uh, corporations that are going conservative? So you have Rumble, which is the conservative uh, the conservative alternative Ooh, good to question. YouTube. Yeah, I like that. And you have other types of organizations that are right. trying to have uh, University of Austin. Yes. Yeah. There's sort of two schools of thought. You either reform existing institutions or you create new ones. I'm of the belief that, that you have to create new institutions. You have to provide an alternative to people. I mean, it's really hard to... You, remember, the left has been on the long march through the institutions for the last, I don't know, 100 years. I think we can do both. I think we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We should push back against this wokeness in the current institutions, in the big institutions, in the traditional American institutions, but also create new ones. I use Rumble more than I use YouTube now, just because I want to support a company that, that embraces freedom of speech as opposed to supporting the big tech. I use Proton Mail for my email. I still have a few Gmail accounts, of course, but I have started thinking about using these alternative media and tech services just because I want to support them. Like, I want them to grow. I want them to be real competition to the big tech woke players. Democratic capitalism is all about choice. That's freedom of choice. So we should have alternative means to support different types of corporations. Just this morning, when we were walking to the podcast, we stopped at a local uh, coffee shop. Yeah, we decided to get coffee there instead, instead of, Starbucks. of Starbucks. Yeah, There's different choices that you can make as a consumer as you're tired of these woke uh, types of policies. You have to start slow. You can't just com completely change your life overnight. Baby steps. Maybe instead of going to eat at some large woke place, go support small businesses. You know, grab a sandwich at the small eatery. There was a poll came out that something like only 23% of Americans identify as woke. They're a loud minority, but they're loud. The problem is that they're loud. And traditional Americans, the silent majority is still just silent. The strength is a number. Even within woke corporation, let's say you're in a meeting and somebody says, I think we should hire based on race. Obviously, that violates the Civil Rights Act. But if you're just alone, you might be thinking, oh, that's wrong. But if you see that like three or four other people have the same mindset, and if you rise up together, then they can't fire all of you. When you're in a, within a woke corporation, try to find people who think like you. Try to form alliances with people and managers. Wokeness is a minority. Even within a company like Apple, the woke minority is only maybe 10% of the workforce, but they're loud and, and they shut everybody down. But, but you can't shut down uh, multiple people, a lot of people. Strength in numbers, form alliances. If the CEO comes out and says, hey, we're going to boycott Georgia because of their abortion bill or whatever, get 10 people and, and write a letter to the CEO, right? He, say, hey, we appreciate what you're doing, but we disagree. You have no business telling democratically elected leaders what they should do within their states. And so form alliances. The main point is form alliances, strength in numbers. Can there be an alternative to Hollywood? You know, you have the case of Gina Carano being fired from The Mandalorian. Oh, that's a good point. Yes. You know, and now she is making different types of movies with different types of producers. Daily Wire is trying to make movies. There's yeah, Christian movies uh, and movie makers and filmmakers. Hollywood being liberal, that goes way all the way back to the critical theories. In order to transform the country, we have to transform the culture first. And Reagan fought when he was with, uh, when he was in Hollywood and he was part of the uh, Screen Actors Guild and Motion Pictures Association of America when he was head of that, he had to fight uh, communists that were actually working in Hollywood to undermine America and making films. So the, the woke Hollywood goes back many, many decades. And so we're trying to find out if there are people who can stand up for the right thing. And sometimes movies work. If you look at Top Gun Maverick, Top Gun Maverick grossing a ton of billions of dollars, a hundred millions of dollars. There was no real political statements in that movie. It's like the, the biggest movie ever. And there was, there was no politics. There was no judgment on war, uh, which was interesting. There was no like war is good, war is bad. There was no, there was, it was patriotism. And I think that's what really resonated with people who are tired of this uh, political correctness. Well, we've covered a lot of ground today. I think we're right around an hour. So, uh, you know, one thing to remember is that there is hope, that there are people standing up to this woke economics 
and woke capitalism, there are ways that we can have diversity of thought throughout the United States that includes corporations, diversity of ideas, diversity of intellect. So hang in there. Uh, I got a little depressed, but I'm feeling more optimistic that we can fight against this. Are you feeling more? I'm feeling way more optimistic. Like I said, a bunch of people are standing up. New avenues are being created. New trails are being blazed. There's still an uphill battle, but the tide is starting to turn. Yeah. And if you find yourself in an implicit bias training meeting, I should have rose, uh, raised my hand and said, what do you mean by critical race theory? What do you mean by systemic racism? Try to turn it around on these folks because they're using buzzwords. Exactly. And they're using these concepts that they hear, that they virtue signal. They may not even know what it means. Make them define it. Exactly. Oftentimes, these diversity consultants that, that, that facilitate these trainings, they don't even know. They can't answer basic questions like, oh, what's the significance of this? What do you mean by that? So ask them questions because pretty soon you realize these people, are, all they know is buzzwords. They have no clue what they're doing. And it's, it's strictly a money play for them, right? They're here they're to make money. And if ESG is going to be uh, asking you to invest based on environmental or social concerns or governance, maybe you should invest in companies that are more conservative, that are apolitical or that, you know, now some companies, of course, are private like Chick-fil-A and Hobby Lobby and others. But uh, I'm sure you could find a list of companies that are apolitical and that don't espouse some of this woke capitalism. I think when you create like an American fund that funds that funds companies that you know, not necessarily right wing, but just but just embrace America. Americanism, believe in the diversity of thoughts, believe in freedom of speech, believe in their employees' ability to speak their mind without sacrificing their employment. And write your member of Congress. Maybe your member of Congress is amenable to doing some types of questioning and hearings. You know, I had that example with Senator Tim Scott, who had the CEOs, these bankster CEOs. Why did you say that? What does this mean? You know, they sit there, they don't even have an answer for that because they don't know because it's HR and the diversity, inclusion and equity people and the ESG people who are coming up with this. So try to find corporations that are not doing it. And uh, before we go, I want to make a quick announcement. I don't know if you caught it this week, but Stephen Miller, who worked for Trump, America First Legal, has launched an initiative that will provide free legal representation to people who have been denied opportunities, employment opportunities, advantage advancement, promotions, bonuses, and so forth due to their color of their skin, due to their to their gender, and so forth. Check out America First Legal for free legal representation if you have been denied employment opportunities because you're white or because you're male or because you're a Christian. That's how we got, that's another angle on this is that that's how that's another way that we're going to hold these corporations accountable is that we're going to take them to court and we're going to fight them to the end. That sounds great. I, I think that's an awesome initiative. So so people like Gina Carano, who would have been fired, would have legal recourse uh, against that studio. Well, look at Disney. Disney. Yeah, was, yeah. yeah, Disney. Exactly. So it's good when we have politicians that uh, that are rebe rebelling against where they got their education. You know, I went to Oberlin College, which is an elitist, very liberal school, not Ivy League, but a lot of people who went to Oberlin also applied to go to Ivy League schools. Maybe they got in, but it's, it's still considered an elitist school. And I started pushing back on that after I got out of school. But back then it wasn't called woke, it was called political correctness PC. So you had to be a certain level of PC to get good grades and, and function better with with uh, professors, right, you, you can't speak out. You, you can't say you can't uh, come out. You, you cannot come out against orthodoxy in your college essay or whatever. Right? You get you, you get marked down immediately. I didn't take any political science and government classes because there were socialists on the uh, committee on the on uh, at the Department of Government at Oberlin College. There was they were bona fide card carrying socialist. And the first class that you had to take required you to buy a subscription to New York Times. Well, I didn't read the New York Times. I didn't agree <laughs> with their I didn't agree with their uh, their outlook on politics. I so. stopped reading the New York Times a couple of years ago. I just couldn't I, I just couldn't handle it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. OK, well, we hope that you found something interesting in this. Check out some of these books. Do your own research. Uh, we have uh, not only Woke Incorporated, but The Dictatorship of Woke Capital by Stephen Solkup. Uh, the subtitle is How Political Correctness Captured Big Business, PC. And then Vivek Ramasamy is uh, Woke Incorporated. Next week, uh, we will talk about Bitcoin. 
which is another important development uh, today. And decentralized finance yeah. and blockchain. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. See you next time. Thank you for listening to The Truth Caviar Show. Email us at truthcaviarshow at gmail.com and let us know what you think about the show. And remember, no bias, no bull, no fear, just hard truths.